And I have just started at Longview Philanthropy. And Longview connects leading philanthropists with outstanding opportunities to protect future generations. And I co-lead our efforts on nuclear weapons policy, and that's what we'll be discussing today. And I'm really excited at the earlier session and today to just see so many people who have been interested in talking about nuclear risk and what we can do to address that risk. And there are these conversations that are happening and that are deepening between the broader EA community and the nuclear policy community. And for the first time at this EAG, we see about a dozen people with deep policy expertise and spending time thinking through these issues from a variety of technical and political dimensions. And if you're interested, I hope you have the chance to find some of these folks around at the conference and to ask them questions, to schedule meetings on swap card. I think the effective altruism community's attention to this issue couldn't be more timely. And the past few months have really shattered this illusion we've had of a stable status quo when it comes to nuclear weapons. We've seen Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We've seen the recent standoff over the Taiwan Straits. And US-Russia and US-China relations are really in crisis right now. We also see the situation in North Korea and Iran India and Pakistan. And I think it's a reminder that things could get much worse. New START, which limits deployed warheads between the US and Russia, is scheduled to expire in 2026. It can't just be extended, it's got to be renegotiated, and it may not even last until then. Meanwhile, we see a slow motion arms race. The numbers of warheads could increase dramatically and we could see the deployment of some really risky systems. So I'd say after some close calls in the first years of the nuclear age, we've done a pretty good job of managing nuclear risks over the past three decades, but that's the blink of an eye. Nuclear weapons were the first technology that showed that our power is outracing our wisdom and today, we're unlocking other technologies that fit that profile. Synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, other technologies. How can we manage these risks for current and future generations? So nuclear weapons are a direct threat, but they also shape the, the context in which we have to solve other global catastrophic risks from pathogens to misaligned artificial intelligence to climate change. So these challenges are inextricably entwined, right? They're technically complicated, they're collective action problems, and they demand coordination between states that are in competition. And today, we are really fortunate to have some of the top non-governmental experts here with us today who have been working on this issue and bring just a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I'm going to introduce them all at once. We'll, jump, we'll come to the stage and then we'll have a discussion. So thank you. Uh, Joan Rolfing is the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which is a nonpartisan global security organization focused on reducing the threat of nuclear and biological threats. Before assuming her role at NTI, Joan worked on reducing WMD threats in government at the Defense Department, on Capitol Hill, on the Department of Energy. And her current work is focused on using systems thinking for leveraging change in complex systems. We also have Emma Belcher, and she is the president of the Plowshares Fund, which works to guarantee all people have a right to a safe and secure future free of nuclear weapons threats. And before this position, she was the Director of Nuclear Challenges at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And she published research on nuclear weapons at the Council on Foreign Relations as a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow. And we also have Christine Parthamore. And she is the CEO of the Council on Strategic Risks, 
the director of the Jan Nolan Center on Strategic Weapons. The Council is a nonpartisan institute devoted to addressing core systemic risks to security in the 21st century. And her prior work includes serving as a senior advisor to the US Department of Defense. So well, I'll join you on the stage and let's have a conversation. So I'm going to ask a few questions of our speakers to get the ball rolling, but I want to remind you that your swap card app allows you to pose questions and also to upvote questions that you want to see answered. So even as we're talking, please take advantage of that. Um, there's really a wealth of knowledge up here. So I think the big question on everyone's right, mind right now is the situation in Ukraine and Putin's recent threat his not so veiled allusion to the use of nuclear weapons. So a couple days ago, he falsely accused NATO of making nuclear threats and reminded us that Russia would, quote, use all weapon systems available to protect its territorial integrity, as well as Russia's people and its independence and freedom. So Emma, from your perspective, does this change how we should think about the nuclear risks in Ukraine? Mm. Thanks, Carl. I think this is obviously particularly concerning. I'd add to the sort of quote that you made, which was he said, I'm not bluffing. And the challenge here, I think, is that you see um, that Ukraine's success at uh, regaining territory and inflicting damage to the Russian military has resulted in this response from Putin. So he's scared um, and he's trying to figure out what he can do to reverse this trend. And um, what I think is particularly alarming about this, if we can just take what he's said, is that he's said that you know any uh, double down on his threat that any attack against Russia's territorial integrity will result potentially in nuclear weapons use. At the same time, he's trying to hold referendums in four territories in which there's currently fighting in Ukraine to make them part of Russian territory, thereby insinuating that once this is done, presumably it will be done according to, to Putin, that if the fighting continues there, he will consider that attack against Russia, thus be able to use nuclear weapons. So continued fighting in these regions raises quite significantly the nuclear threat. And all of this talk and rhetoric makes the nuclear danger much more intense when it comes to accident miscalculation, misunderstanding that have long been present mm -hmm. in the nuclear dangers, but as the fighting escalates, there becomes a greater likelihood that something could go wrong catastrophically. Yeah. So there are a few things here, there are some immediate concerns when we're thinking about nuclear risk. How do we make sure that we um, prevent Putin from doing something like that, not push him into a corner so he does use nuclear weapons, but how do we make sure he is not allowed to blackmail the world using these tools as he has? And we see that his use of these nuclear weapons has enabled war crimes, famine, humanitarian crisis, um, impacted the global economy. So nuclear weapons are at the back of this conflict. And if we sort of allow him to learn the lesson that these weapons are powerful tools of coercion, we're in a very bad situation moving forward. So we have to think about how do we get out of this situation peacefully? How do we not send a signal that these nuclear weapons are powerful tools of coercion, not just for Putin, but for others? And how do we try to get back on track to a world where we're working towards a safer, secure future for all in which we're not constantly living under this fear of nuclear use? Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned in your opening remarks, Carl, we are facing this situation now. There are ripple effects with decreased cooperation under New START, the prospect of another New START agreement not being negotiated, a new nuclear arms race and proliferation concerns. So this is really a pivotal point for us as we look at nuclear policy going forward. How do we move forward so we can no longer be held blackmailed by nuclear dictators? Yeah, and you mentioned accident, miscalculation and uncertainty, and that's something that we deal with 
in the fog of war and everything else. And Christine, when you look at these scenarios, what do you think are the pathways through which nuclear weapons might be used? And we can start with Ukraine, but if you want to expand beyond that, I'm, I'm interested in which of those pathways you're most concerned about. Yeah, absolutely. And I would echo everything that Emma just said, of course. Um, um, the norm against weapons of mass destruction has to remain strong, and it's obviously probably its most fragile point ever in history, and we're deeply concerned about that. And so a big part of our focus has been what are those pathways that could accelerate or sort of bleed into the actual crossing the threshold of the use of nuclear weapons, and what do those look like? And then what can we do in terms of helping to design policies and advocate for them, or opening dialogues or things like that that will help reduce those pathways and hopefully get rid of them as we get toward this vision of these weapons not being available for coercion and blackmail and all of this other stuff over the long term. And so in terms of the, uh, I think the Ukraine situation is the easiest for painting the picture of what some of those uses could look like. Um, and obviously, I, I think any use of nuclear weapon in this particular conflict would be out of desperation, not out of a point of strength. But that's the reality of the situation already. So that box is unfortunately already checked. It's already the, the reality in the situation that we're looking at. Um, so there are a few different different types of potential nuclear weapons use that are commonly discussed in the current scenario. One could be uh, used for signaling, so detonating a relatively small, um, still very, very large, but relatively small nuclear weapon over, the, uh, over water, for example. So not targeting a population or a military site or anything like that, but still signaling that he is willing to cross that threshold into nuclear weapons use. Um, given his statements over the past week or so that focus on acquisition of territory um, that he considers to be part of the, mush the Russian motherland and the fact that he considers the protection of the Russian motherland to be an existential issue for Russia, um, to the point that he would consider using nuclear weapons, that might be another pathway um, by which that occurred. Uh, so you see all these different scenarios coming through. One of the other pathways that we're very concerned about is uh, involves the blending across these different technological domains. So for a long time, our government and others in the United States have expressed concern that P Putin might use chemical or biological weapons uh, to depopulate a specific territory uh, and drive a certain, certain portion of the population out as part of the territorial acquisition uh, and domain that he's trying to seek in this, in this arena. Um, any use of chemical or biological weapons is likely to be responded to. And while our governments are vague in terms of what that response would be, I can't see the international community just sitting by and not responding. Putin may then view that escalation as getting again into that territory of viewing it as an existential risk or required for protecting the Russian motherland or some other scenario that would convince him that crossing the nuclear threshold um, was somehow acceptable or wise in that particular situation. Um, one other set of circumstances, and that I would say too, so outside of these scenarios, we're very concerned about similar scenarios in, in North Korea. Um, given the uh, large, widespread assumption by many countries that they have extensive chemical and biological weapons programs, uh, as well as their nuclear program. And the doctrine and uh, even the public statements from our government and from uh, North Korea themselves and others um, have a really weird intertwining that would show lots of potential escalation pathways that would involve the potential use of all of these different weapons and how that might go. And that's a very, very, very dangerous situation, and it also one that would be very, very hard to control if any use of weapons of mass destruction were to occur. A uh, final thing I would say would be, in the, in the realm of miscalculations, uh, a big trend in the world in recent years, not just by Russia, but by the United States and multiple other countries, has been pushing toward types of nuclear weapons that are uh, viewed as having a broader range of utility, whether it's for coercion or some of these other functions, um, but for addressing other countries' uh, chemical or biological risks that they might pose against them. Um, more countries are getting into viewing nuclear weapons uh, in terms of moving into uh, weapons types where you have conventional and nuclear variants of the same systems that would be launched from the same platforms. So if you imagine if there's a conflict between the United States and Russia that actually gets hot and active, a lot of the nuclear cruise missiles that they've been launching from their submarines, they have, or I'm sorry, the conventional uh, cruise missiles that they've been launching from their submarines, they have nuclear variants. If we're in a hot conflict with Russia, if things continue down this pathway, and there's a sense that they are sending off these cruise missiles toward the United States or a NATO ally or others, there could very easily be a, mis uh, a miscalculation that there's a fair chance that it's a nuclear attack. So you're saying it's really hard to differentiate between the 
conventional warheads and the nuclear warheads? On some systems, sure. And some of them involve uh, deliberate, uh, a lot of the policies between our countries, like the United States and Russia, have trended in the direction of deliberately introducing more ambiguity about the scenarios in which we would use those weapons. The ones that would most likely be used would be the types of weapons that have these lower yields or amb ambiguous quality to them. And uh, there are a lot of practitioners on both sides in both of our countries and in others that actually think this ambiguity is a good thing and have been trying to drive more of it. But we see very, very clearly in the situation in Ukraine, you are in the fog of war. There is an act of conflict. More ambiguity is not going to be good for anybody. So and who's arguing for more ambiguity and what's the case that more ambiguity is good? Sure, so there are concerns uh, in US policy, for example, the not the current administration, but the last administration's nuclear posture review, which sets uh, administration policy basically on how they view nuclear weapons as part of national strategy. Um, it opened up the thinking about potential using nuclear weapons to deter, but also kind of being ambiguous, ambiguous excuse me, um, it, it described them as a hedge against chemical or biological or strategic cyber attacks. And some of those were always part of doctrine in terms of nuclear weapons deterring attacks by those means. But calling them a hedge against those threats was another broadening of thinking about the utility of nuclear weapons. And again, the, for the advocates of that side of things, which uh, you know, there's a lot of people who agree with this, I don't personally, um, they think that having that ambiguity there would actually give Putin or somebody like him more pause before conducting a, a nuclear attack or a strategic level chemical or biological or weapon or a cyber weapon attack uh, against the United States, our allies, because they don't know what our line is. And so they, they wouldn't want to make sure that they accidentally cross it. Um, but again, it, we see how different sides are thinking and reacting in a conflict scenario. And uh, my take is that that ambiguity is making everything much, much more likely to hedge in the direction of higher risk rather than less. So Joan, do you agree with those assessments? Are there, do you see any benefits to ambiguity or do you, do you agree with Christine? I, I agree. Uh, I think Christine's got it exactly right that the ambiguity exacerbates the, the risk. And I want to just go back to some of the points that Emma made um, about this particular moment that we're in with the dangers being really escalated, the, the danger of use being really escalated. And I guess I would make the observation that um, nuclear deterrence has been flipped on its head, right? The whole strategy for how the nuclear order was supposed to work has been, been flipped on its head by President Putin. Instead of using his nuclear arsenal to deter the use of nuclear weapons by another nuclear weapon state, he's using it as a shield of aggression against it. Uh, a non-nuclear weapon state. And the reason why this is so important is that when we think about the consequences of what's happening in Ukraine and what it means for nuclear security downstream, one of the things we have to be very much worried about is what are the lessons that other non-nuclear weapon states are taking away from this? You know, particularly if a nuclear weapon um, ends up being used in Ukraine, but even without that, right? If you're Japan or South Korea or Taiwan and you're thinking about other nuclear powers in your neighborhood, um, might you think now is the time for us to build our own nuclear arsenal? So I, I think we cannot overstate the urgency of getting through this war, concluding this war without nuclear use, and then we need to be working really hard to repair the global nuclear order. Um, I would say at the moment there is no global nuclear order. We have a global nuclear disorder, and this is a, a moment where we need to you know, think very critically about how we can um, strengthen the safeguards around the existing system and work over the long term to get us to a safer place and a safer paradigm. So that sounds good to me. Specifically, what does that mean? Repairing the nuclear order, ending the war? I think everyone wants the war to end, right? Um, but beyond that, repairing the nuclear order, what 
ought we be doing differently than we're currently doing? And the U.S. can't go this alone, right? Repairing the nuclear order requires efforts from all the nuclear weapon states and many non-nuclear weapon states and nuclear allied states as well. So what do we do? Easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to start kind of at what I think the end point needs okay. to be, uh, because I think the system of nuclear deterrence that we have today, I understand why we have it and how we got here, but it is not a, a system that is sustainable and compatible with a long-term future where humanity flourishes, right? This is a system that's capable of inflicting existential risk on humanity. And we need to be demanding a system of existential security. We've been operating under a theory that the best way to prevent the use of a nuclear weapon is by threatening the annihilation of our adversaries. And that might have been the best we could do circa 1950 when this strategy was developed and we you know, built an arsenal to make it credible and, um, and uh, wrapped a doctrine and policies around it and a set of practices where we exercise these forces. Um, but we live in a very different world. We're not in the slow analog bipolar world of 1950. We are in you know, the year 2022 where there are nine entangled nuclear states with um, you know, some 13,000 nuclear weapons deployed, and we're in a hot war right now. So I think what we need to be thinking about is something that looks more like a nuclear control, nuclear technology control regime that puts high safeguards around dual-use nuclear technologies. It's going to take several decades to reach that point, but that ought to be our destination. If that type of a system fails, we don't have civilizational collapse or you know, an extinction event. We have a bad day, and you know, one or two nuclear weapons uh, can be built and maybe even detonated, but that's a far cry from thousands of weapons in an exchange. Um, so how do we get there, and what does that mean for the present moment? I think we need to do an awful lot of work to reset norms around uh, norms of you know, how, how governments think about and behave and treat their nuclear weapon system to move away from the competition that we have right now and to back off of the arms race mm -hmm. that we're in right now, to build some stability, to take near-term risk reduction measures um, that make us safe while we're on this journey yeah. to existential security. So I want to remind all of you that you have the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists here. So check, check open swap card. It would be great to get some good questions in here and upvote the questions you want to see answered. I think my question is going to be about technology. Mm -hmm. And several of you have mentioned the role of technology. Is technology on our side here? Uh, our ability to sense, detect, communicate at high speeds is better than it's ever been before. Our ability to communicate securely. Um, is that working in our favor? Or are there reasons to think technology is making the nuclear balance more dangerous? I don't know who wants to leap in on that. I'm happy to jump right on it and say, I think it cuts both ways, mm -hmm. right? We see within the existing system, um, you know, cyber, the, the existing system has a lot of points of cyber vulnerability. There's a lot of exposure, and that makes the existing system even riskier yeah. than it already was. On the other hand, we see, as you say, new detection and sensing technologies. I personally think there's a lot of opportunity with machine learning and AI and big data to use those tools to identify um, uh, you know, patterns of behavior, uh, nuclear activities in states, we can use it to build that technology control regime. So it, it, cuts, it cuts both ways. Um, but I think in the end, it um, enables the, the paradigm shift that gets us to existential security. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with, with what Joan said. I agree with her vision of where we need to get. I believe it's possible. We have to do the work to get there. Um, 
I also agree, but I want to also put a counterpoint on the potential for machine learning and AI. Mm -hmm. It's maybe not a counterpoint, it's more a caution about as we look at this, what do we need to be thinking about? So I think there are huge benefits, as you say, in terms of analyzing data, making sense. We can use um, AI potentially for um, forecasting and, and scenario kind of work and thinking about what might happen. Um, you know, potentially it could be useful in making certain types of decisions. What chills me to the bone a little bit is when I hear people talk about using AI as a way to maybe potentially make launch decisions because human beings are inherently vulnerable with biases and maybe it would be better to um, leave those decisions up to, to machines. And I think one of the things that makes me worry about that is you think about, all right, there are algorithms and systems and data that's all put together in a certain way by humans who have biases, and how are we setting up those types of algorithms? What data are we using? And who is making those decisions? And I think one of the challenges in this nuclear policy space is that since the beginning of the nuclear age decades ago, there's been a small, quite homogenous group of people making decisions about this. And decision making hasn't benefited from the type of diversity of, of intellectual background, perspectives, discipline that we know has helped us make better decisions. So if you're then trying to use AI and systems drawing on that kind of old way of decision making and thinking without the sort of benefit of diversity, you potentially input the same kind of biases that are getting us into this particular situation in the moment that could potentially result in us going one of two ways. So now that's a very extreme kind of example of how we need to just be careful as we think about AI, but I, that's where I think the way we solve this is by bringing in people with those different backgrounds welcoming them to the community of people focusing on this existential problem, helping with problem solving, um, because we know that those kind of methods will get us where we're going. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about China and Taiwan for a moment. Um, what are the scenarios you're most concerned about there? And are there things we ought to be doing now to avoid bad outcomes? Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> I was about to agree with Emma on her last point. <laughs> yeah, yeah go I, ahead. Could I do it elaborate? Yeah, please elaborate. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's so much there. Yeah. It, it actually ties to a lot of this too, right? And the, the actual decision making that occurs and that these technologies are here. And I think it's really important that we err very, very heavily on the side of safety as much as possible. So um, the long-term and even medium-term effects of nuclear weapons use is not part of war planning. It's just not. It's how to prevail in a certain conflict in certain scenarios. That element of the consequences is just not part of the process. People might care about it if they're making those decisions, but they don't sit there using that to calculate how they win and prevail in a specific conflict, especially if it has gone nuclear. So the decision making itself, we have to understand the context in which all of these tools would be applied. And um, I know I've sat, I've sat in rooms where people take uh, very, very simplistic models of mm. nuclear weapons effects that are meant just for crisis management if there's a release. And they use those to claim, um, which again, have no long-term modeling or anything attached to them, highly simplistic. And I've seen people use them in academic writing and sitting in a room uh, like to claim that using X size of nuclear weapon detonated in this spot above North Korea at this elevation wouldn't kill that many people. And it would probably save a lot of lives in conflict. And that is incredibly dangerous. And that there's a very real risk that tools even that are meant to be used for positive decision making are misused or um, just used in a way that gets us to wrong answers. I've seen people who um, have gone through exercises with ML systems and things like that to try to figure out if you're in a nuclear conflict, what's the point of stalemating? Or, you know, how do you get to a point of a stalemate in that and then start to de-escalate? And the pathway that that leads you to in this particular instance was uh, have a lot of so-called low yield nuclear weapons and be ready to actually use them. How dangerous is that? That's, I mean, they were clearly asking the wrong questions, right? Which is how many nukes can we use? Which should not be the question at all. It should be how you don't get there in the first place. Um, so I think uh, that is, there's a lot of reality to that context though that's outside of control, certainly of NGOs, but even of wide groups of decision makers. And so I think a lot of erring on the side of safety is really important. Um, Taiwan, that's a, <laughs> um, if I 
the, if anybody else wants to answer on the Taiwan side, I think we just need to be talking to China about nuclear weapons issues as well. And mm -hmm. so um, yeah. we've put a lot of time into trying to figure out where the points of commonality might be. So for example, right now, both the US and China, our policies are not to put nuclear warheads on ground launch intermediate range systems. We both have conventional systems. We're both very concerned about each other. Just on the conventional side, we're also very concerned that the other country is going to go nuclear with these particular systems. And then they have a whole new type of nuclear threat introducing new dynamics into exactly that type of scenario. So what if these weapons exist in a future of five years from now, for example, mm -hmm. on both sides where Taiwan has kind of stalemated for a while and is escalating further. And so I think there are, aside from managing the crisis itself right yeah. now, there are things that we could do preemptively, even just to entrench current policies that are less yeah. bad than they could be and stop both of our countries from going in even more dangerous directions in the coming yeah. years. So what you hear often is that China doesn't want to talk about nuclear weapons with the United States. They have a policy of opacity, mm -hmm. which they have a much smaller nuclear arsenal right now, and many argue that they see that as a form of safety to not disclose information. Are there useful talks that can be had between the United States and Taiwan even in that context? And how do you get started? The official level is always hard for sure because the, all the politics involved with both countries, but substantively there's tons of fruitful ground. There are lots of things that, uh, weapon systems that you, the United States has given up in the past, for example, that China has not yet built. What if we can get to a space where we talk about just keeping it that way, and again, on the arms control side, making sure that new nuclear weapons and new types are not yeah. built and not introduced into the region. So get, let's get specific here. What specific weapons are we talking about and what would restraint look like in that context? Uh, so another example would be nuclear sea launch cruise missiles. So uh, we and other countries have conventional sea launch cruise missiles that don't have nuclear warheads. Um, ours were given up originally in the United States by President George W. Bush as part of the presidential nuclear initiatives. Uh, in um, uh, 91, was it? 91. Yeah, 91. Great move. So these were, these were weapons that could be part of a nuclear sneak attack, basically, which most nuclear weapon states view as as creating this sense of vulnerability that's very lopsided and really really skewing how, view, how countries view stability in the nuclear domain and the strategic domain between each other. So the United States gave them up. Our policy in recent years has been to bring them back. Current policy is to reverse that, which we think is a good one. But China doesn't have this type of nuclear capability at all right now. Um, so can we talk to them about, even if it's not like a bilateral treaty, again, maybe there's grounds to talk about how destabilizing this type of nuclear weapon is for this particular region and destabilizing for both countries. Um, we're all better off if these types of nuclear weapons do not exist in the scenario that both of our countries are dealing with. So. I think you make a really good point too that there's a tradition of trying to negotiate treaties, but there's also a tradition of a variety of other confidence building measures and mutual unilateral steps, which end up looking a lot like a treaty in the end. Um, and we shouldn't despair because there may still be trade space on some of these weapon systems and ultimately the interests of the United States and China and even in terms of Russia, we, we share a lot of common interests in avoiding certain outcomes. So there may be things that can be done. Um, even if you don't have a partner who you view as reliable, there are ways to take steps that are tentative or reversible and see if they're reciprocated. Can I just jump on the... the Sorry, Emma, did you want to say something? Yes, but if you were about to talk about Taiwan in particular, I was about to make a more general observation. I was going to make a China-related, yes, not a necessarily exactly. a Taiwan-specific, but I, I completely agree with what Christine said about um, let's not wait for China to become more like the United States. Let's see if we can um, engage in a dialogue where we uh, persuade China not to become more like us. Um, diplomacy is essential. The Chinese do need to be willing to engage, however, and at the moment, any governmental nuclear discussion is considered very sensitive, and I think until China feels like it's caught up, 
with the United States and Russia, we're unlikely to see the kind of engagement in nuclear diplomacy that we need. So you feel like they're planning to catch up and they're not going to negotiate until they've caught up? That's what I fear. There's evidence in some of the conversations we've had uh, explaining, yeah. using that as the rationale mm -hmm. for why they have been unwilling to come to the table. So what does that world look like where, the, where China has caught up with the number of deployed warheads in the United States and Russia? Um, what, what are the next steps in, in that scenario? I think the next steps are clearly a, a trilateral, some kind of a multilateral negotiation. I would hope we don't need to wait until China catches up, right, that we find a way to enter into diplomacy in advance of that. And, and that's one of the things we need to be working on now. And, and one way in which maybe we start that is by confidence building, um, building bridges, building a discussion with the Chinese about nuclear issues and, um, you know, helping helping China, you know, begin to engage actively in this area, even if they're not yet willing to negotiate. I did also want to throw a recommendation yeah, out, please. which is uh, if you guys want a really good read um, about how the U.S. and China end up getting into uh, nuclear war with each other, there's a a uh, very chilling fiction book written by Admiral James Stavridis called 2034. Um, it's terrific. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite vivid, and it shows kind of yeah. how the U.S. And, and China stumbles into, mm -hmm. into a war at some point in the not-too-distant future. Can this situation be managed without looking at missile defenses? Do you believe that missile defenses are a a non-negotiable issue for the United States and China and are going to impede any of these conversations or are they a distraction? I hope they're not a non-negotiable issue. I think if we have learned anything, we should have learned that the U.S. withdrawal from the ABM treaty has in actuality triggered an active arms race with Russia, which of course, you know, Russia told us when we withdrew that this would be an eventual outcome, and now they've developed and are deploying a whole raft of systems that can mm -hmm. evade missile defenses. Um, I think what we need to figure out, it's, it's not a new problem. There's an offense-defense relationship that needs to be taken into account if we're going to create a stable nuclear deterrent while we work toward a system that replaces nuclear deterrence as our strategy for preventing nuclear use. So I think embedded in the comments that Christine, Joan, and you two, Carl, have just, have just made are that it's really important when we think about progress and what's worth doing to recognise that there's an instinct to want to make things much better, transformational change. But it's equally as good and potentially at some points even not better to make sure that when things are going badly, you do the work to prevent them from going worse. Mm -hmm. Or that when things are on track, but there are signs that difficulties and challenges are mm -hmm. coming, that you prevent those difficulties and you keep things on track. Yeah. And doing that work, even though it might not sound like, OK, let's prevent things from getting worse with China by making sure that they don't um, create more new types of, of weapons and systems and we'll keep them there, that doesn't sound glamorous. Um, and it's thankless work to make sure we get there, but we have to recognise that that is really valuable so that we can get on a track where you can work for that transformational change that we all see. I think that's really an important point, and we can think about change in many ways and philanthropic investments in change. Philanthropy can create good trends that didn't exist before. It can speed up good trends that are already happening. And these are really attractive investments because you can brag about them to your board. <laughs> but you can also slow negative trends. And in some cases, that can be just as valuable. If you can slow a negative trend, you can create a lot of value in the world and avert some really bad outcomes. And um, I think that a lot of the work that we will be doing 
in the coming years is just playing defense and trying to hold the line and trying to maintain a status quo on nuclear issues, which is risky, but could be much, much worse. And we do not want to see an unfettered arms race in which countries are increasing the number of weapons they have deployed, increasing new and novel types of delivery systems, which, as Christine said, some of them have very short time of flight, some of them have ambiguity in terms of what types of warheads they're carrying, ambiguity about what their targets are. Um, the entanglement of conventional warfighting and nuclear systems is another issue that brings me a lot of concern. There are certain types of things you ought not to target during a war or even plan to target in peacetime. So all of these questions are intertwined, conventional war, the space domain, and rapid technological change. So I'm interested to hear from each of you, what do you think are some of the most promising trends that are happening right now? So we've talked about how bad things might get. Do you see signs specifically for hope, things that we might put forward and push upon? And from an EA perspective, are there things that this community in particular has to contribute to the challenge of reducing the risk and the consequences of nuclear war? So Christine, I don't know if you want to start or Absolutely. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. The, and uh, I think most of the fruitful ground in the near term, again, hopefully all gets to that longer term vision. Um, but the space that we're, we're in, I fundamentally agree with Emma. It's there are a lot of things that could get a lot worse and actually have been getting a lot worse. In terms of signs of hope, um, the US policy uh, that's been developed over the last uh, two years, year and a half, whatever the administration has been now, has had uh, increasingly signs of restraint again mm -hmm. and moving back toward a position of restraint and not just sort of full force, this country's building X, we need to build Y. We need to do what they're doing. We need to mirror them. And then getting into this racing behavior that we've seen started in different corners of the world. I think that's actually really, really hopeful that the United States has gotten back to that point of restraint. And I think there's a lot of NATO allies that really agree with that. And so I think the point now, again, is how do we crystallize it and start making sure, again, we don't go back in the other direction and then build on that, even if it seems incremental now. Um, things could be going a lot worse, but there are signs we might be starting to bend that curve. And so mm -hmm. there are lots of options, though, to continue bending in that direction. So on the UK side, for example, their new prime minister declared that they're entering into a new uh, review of what they call their, uh, their integrated review of their de defense and foreign policy. And so um, there is a chance that, and some people are buzzing, that they should uh, actually introduce a wider range of nuclear-capable missiles to their arsenal going forward, which would be a really, really sizable shift mm -hmm. in UK nuclear strategy and in their approach. They've been very, very restrained to date. So it's a huge win if we can just keep the UK in this more restrained space, stop them from introducing more ambiguity through the systems that they're going, and hopefully then we will also be more restrained in going into these different types and adding all this change into the system and in how countries calculate off of each other. So I see a lot of hope in that. Um, from uh, all my conversations with people in the EA community, uh, from the issues that you're working on and understanding of nuclear issues and across the board, I think there's a really deep appreciation that getting to long-termist goals is going to require steps in the near term as well. Um, all these things that we're doing are hard. They're going to take enormous effort, um, but you've got to start and you need a lot of, of good people who are committed to moving in the right direction, figuring out, okay, what do we do now to keep those curves bending in the right direction? And I feel that very present here uh, in the networks in the EA community and, and broader too. Um, people understand, I think, at a, not just because of Ukraine, but in recent years, the world is in layers and layers of crises and there's so much pressure on the system. And the world 10, 15 years from now is going to look different. It just is, and we know that, and everybody's very clear on that, but there are tons of people who are committed to trying to make that future look better than the one that we came out of that has led, frankly, led to this space that the world is in today. I think that's right, and I think a lot of current policies suffer from a failure of imagination, and I think you talk about the world looking different in 10 or 15 years. The systems we have in place now weren't designed 
from the ground up by an assessment as to exactly what we need at this moment. They're the evolution of systems that were put in place a long time ago and that evolved through bureaucratic politics, inter-service rivalry, and the technologies that were available at the time. And so I think a couple of you have talked about the need to work backwards and to think about where we want to go and figure out what systems and investments we need to be in making now to enable that world. And I think that we can talk about some others as well. Um, and I don't know, um, I didn't give Emma or Joan a chance to answer that specific question about things you're excited about putting in place. So I'd like to hear that. Yeah, well, and things like... Excuse me. Mic fell off. Sorry. Let me Mike's reattach excited. this. The mic got <laughs> so excited it jumped right off. Um, things happen. It's good lesson. I think one of the things I'm really excited about is the energy and momentum I see coming out of the effective altruism community. Um, but even beyond the effective altruism community, I think. You know, the, the generation, several generations behind mine is coming with um, an open mind, not encumbered by a way of thinking about the world, but looking for ways. I mean, this vision of trying to enable human flourishing over the long term is a really um, powerful, positive vision. And that's animating people to, um, to look at the whole range of existential threats in a new way. So I'm incredibly excited by the energy I see coming out of this community, the problem solving, the new ideas being brought to the table, and the communities that are, mm -hmm. that are coming up uh, within and, and around effective altruism. Are there any ideas in particular you would love to see more interchange between the ideas coming out of the EA community and out of the traditional nuclear policy community? That's a question for anyone. Yeah, I would say, it, you know, if not specific ideas, it's a way of problem solving. Mm -hmm. It's the approach to problem yeah. solving. It's using interdisciplinarity. I think that's really important. You mentioned that earlier, Emma. It's bringing new and diverse perspectives to the table, um, not just uh, you know a, a nationalist perspective mm -hmm. from uh, the standpoint of an individual yeah. state. These things are all really important. And then it's intersections of different mm -hmm. fields, like you know, the, the foresight uh, and forecasting field. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of power in yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's, it's good to highlight that. I think we could learn a lot from the work that's going on in foresight and prediction markets, the, also the, some of the um, thinking through decision making and how can we systematically improve decision making both on the individual level and the institutional level. And certainly um, familiarity with some of the new and emerging technologies that are coming forward. We need that. Absolutely. We need that badly. And, and, and for governance as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree with more with everything that uh, everyone said. And I think um, just to underscore the importance of the interconnectedness of all of these issues that people are concerned about today climate change, um, human rights, um, uh, having a flourishing, people having flourishing lives that are safe and secure. Because when you look at nuclear weapons and this example, just to go back to Ukraine, you know, Putin's weapons, he hasn't used them in the sense of detonating them, but he's used them to invade a country, enable war crimes, um, humanitarian crisis affect the global economy, and we see the interconnections here. He hasn't even detonated a weapon. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it stays that way, but it's really showing us. So I think the interest and what we as a nuclear community that's pretty small, that has typically been isolated, we can really use ideas from different fields, people from neuroscience who understand decision making under pressure, um, artists, um, uh, lawyers, people who can really look and problem solve, as mm -hmm. Joan said, this approach yeah. is what we desperately need. And, and I'm encouraged because we are seeing these yeah. people. We just need to be able to support them and their interest so that this mm -hmm. work can flourish in concert with other areas that we care about. Okay, so all of the sudden, 
the swap card app that had no questions, all of a sudden has like 30 questions on here. <laughs> so um, someone joked on Twitter that if we weren't complaining about swap card, there would be no small talk at EA <laughs> conferences. So, um, now I, I go from having no questions from the audience to having too many than we can possibly answer. So um, I'm going to uh, put these out here. The, the ones that have the most upvotes, and I'll let you respond to the ones that you want to because we only have about 10 minutes left. Um, so we have a question from Dylan Myers. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, which do you see as greater nuclear risk? New, oh, uh, new nuclear countries that lack experience in communication like India and Pakistan, or more experienced countries like Russia that may deem now crossing the nuclear threshold as rational? I'll let you think about that for a second. And another question by Jake Eaton, that had, Jake Eaton, thanks Jake, who has a lot of upvotes. Congress just passed $50 billion with the official rationale of upgrading obsolescent nuclear infrastructure. How necessary was that? And how large does the nuclear arsenal need to be? I'll let you tackle either of those. Uh, the first one, both. Um, but there are kind of different flavors to it, of course. Yeah. And I, I think we actually get into a really dangerous space if we start to think about which really, really, really horrible situation is slightly less bad than the other one in terms of use of nuclear weapons. So South Asia is facing an absolutely climatic nightmare. Um, they have tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, they, both countries, Pakistan and India, have doctrines for using those nuclear weapons that involve very vague scenarios that could also involve field generals making decisions about potential deployment of tactical level nuclear weapons. Um, there are huge tensions, massive displacement of people. Parts of India are uh, projected to be uninhabitable in the coming decades. Literally, people won't be able to live there year round because the climate is getting so bad in different areas. This is a, it's a strategic nightmare. Um, and it's not their inexperience. They're very smart, wonderful, well-meaning people in the defense establishments in both of these countries. And, uh, but they are dealing with so many different pressures and the types of nuclear weapons they have and the doctrines that they have for thinking about using them, that's the danger zone. So all this other stuff is happening and you have to assume that it's going to continue happening and probably gonna get worse. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be more fragility, more instability in these regions. Mm -hmm. That's almost certainly going to happen in the decades ahead. Let's like take the types of weapons mm -hmm. and the doctrines for how they might be employed and see if even they together or independently or whatever, we can have conversations about pulling some of that back. In Russia, I think we've covered pretty frequently yeah. mm -hmm. where the dangers in those scenarios are. So concerned about both, but the dangers are slightly different. Different, and, yeah, yeah, different characteristics. Good, and I, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that or to the question of nuclear modernization. Um, I, can, I can speak to yeah. that, but, but thank you for the, you nailed and, that answer, it's both. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, the, the question about the obsolescent yeah. investment in yeah. obsolescent infrastructure. Um, so I'm gonna preface this by saying, I actually believe we need to be working toward nuclear prohibition and that we have uh, way more weapons than we need, though I do not advocate for unilateral disarmament by any state. I don't think that gets us where we need to go. And all that having been said, I think that as long as we, in any state, still maintain nuclear weapons uh, or still have a nuclear arsenal, we need to make sure that we can um, maintain them safely and securely. Yeah. And so there is a maintenance process and that requires infrastructure and facilities that have to be kept up. Um, some of this infrastructure is quite old, dates back to mm -hmm. the Manhattan Project, and literally buildings, ceilings are, are mm -hmm. falling in on some of these buildings. Do I like that we're mm -hmm. having to invest 50 billion instead in, in um, you know, rebuilding some of those mm -hmm. facilities so that they continue yeah. to maintain the arsenal? No, but that's kind of where we're at until yeah. we get serious about unwinding yeah. our arsenal. And we're talking about over a trillion dollars over 30 years, right? Yeah. This is a much bigger but that's number a, when that, you look That's at, true. And, we're looking yeah. at a modernization investment um, in, of you know, building replacement yeah. forces yeah. over time, but this infrastructure yeah. investment yeah. is primarily energy department yeah. facilities mm -hmm. um, that are so some of, some of that's very valuable, 
investment and some of it is wasteful or unnecessary if we think about the forces that we want in the well, future? Of that, Did I of that, that trillion dollars, mm -hmm. yeah. we don't have to spend all of that, right? Mm -hmm. We could decide right. not we to modernize a whole leg things, of the triad. Certain things are phased in And over save time. hundreds of millions or yeah. you know, billions. Do, do uh, we need the land-based leg of the triad? It may be an area where we have some disagreement among our panelists. Uh, I don't believe we do. Okay, so you would get rid of the ICBMs if I you had the opportunity. What about you, Emma? I would too. Yeah, Christine? Not right now. Not right now. <laughs> uh, so they play a, a role in stabilizing the situation? I'm much more focused on the weapons that I think are more likely to be used or yeah. to drive arms racing behavior or raise the risks of miscalculations. Mm -hmm. And as much as I feel like it is an utter waste of money to replace them and not just let them age out over time, yeah. it's also... I don't personally view that as changing the game in the way that some of these other types of nuclear capabilities seem to be driving other countries to change the game with each other. Well, I just feel like we got into a meaty conversation <laughs> we there that we could uh, pursue we further. We only have a few minutes left. <laughs> and I want to make sure we get some of the other conversa some of the other questions as well. Um, we have uh, Joanna Weotarek writes, from a student perspective, what impactful career options are there in nuclear risk reduction? that EA should go for specifically. And James Ong asks, do you think young people today, for example, current college students, are more or less aware of nuclear threats than mm -hmm. earlier generations? On the career side, I mean, I think we need people from a range of disciplines, so we don't just need political scientists, international relations scholars, who, or people who've studied nuclear weapons. Yeah. Uh, we need engineers, physicists, we need lawyers, we need... Theologians. Um, yes, theologians, a whole range. Ethicists. Ethicists, absolutely. I also think in particular we need communications and messaging mm -hmm. specialists because I think one thing we haven't done well as a community is we've been very good about doing the um, expert analysis, research projects and um, analysis feeding into recommendations to give to policymakers. What we don't have are constituencies demanding change. Mm -hmm. So unless we're able to really communicate in a way to people who care about this, what they can do to help, unless we can take this issue from being one of absolute terror and fear and I don't want any part of it, I don't want to know, someone else fix the problem, to being able to show people how they can help and affect change, mm -hmm. how we communicate this is really key and I just feel this is where we've fallen down a little bit mm -hmm. so those kind of skills are yeah. going to be really critical. Yeah, important. and I want to flag uh, Sebastian Geshvind asked, taking a realist perspective, is there anything people not working in the American State or Defense Department can do to reduce the nuclear threat. So I don't think we necessarily have time to discuss that here, but that's a really good set of conversations as well. Tomorrow, you can track these folks down and have that, ask that question, because I think as Emma said, there is a range of competencies and expertise and experiences and perspectives that we need in order to tackle this problem. It's not an engineering problem. It's not a political science problem. It is a human problem. So I don't know if you had anything more to add about young people and um, tracks that people might, you know, if you're, if you're learning about nuclear weapons as an EA and you're thinking of this as, an, as a cause area, how do you position yourself to really make a difference on this issue? Yeah, come to events like this and network. <laughs> Um, if, you're, if you're really interested in studying this area, though, I definitely recommend that people go broader and definitely learn as much as you can about past conflicts and the decision-making that has occurred in past active conflicts. The decision-making behind the United States and other countries developing weapons of mass destruction across the full spectrum, and you start to understand how countries might move in that direction today and what that might look like and how the decisions might go and things like that and how, how countries and individual actors actually behave in warfare, mm -hmm. um, I think is lost in a lot of the theory, frankly. Yeah. And that's, that's uh, again, that reality needs to come through in a prism. But I was just going to say, in terms of the building on what you were saying, yeah. I think the EA community generally has focused really, really well on what's tractable, too. And we might be in a situation a couple of years from now where the most tractable ways out of the worst nuclear trajectories that we could be facing might not involve the United States at all. 
I think we've had recent pasts where there's very little that would have been tractable in terms of really, really moving US policy to a safer yeah. space. And so there might be lots of different futures. It's not yeah. either or, but right. there might also be situations where the United States at all is not part of where the most and, momentum is. And there's a tremendous role for non-nuclear weapon states to lead the way mm -hmm. in many of these cases and to build stronger institutions and strengthen norms that reinforce the view that nuclear weapons are not about national security, they are a threat to our existential security. So how do we move beyond a narrow, narrow, narrow national security frame and think about the long view, right? How do we live with these weapons, not for 77 years, but for 1,000 years, if we're going to have a flourishing future? We've got to figure this out. And there are lots of people from other countries who think about nuclear weapons differently. And we can learn a lot from those perspectives as well. And that culture work really needs to start. I think the US is pivotal. If the US is not on board as the you know, state with the most capable conventional military, and we say we still need nuclear weapons, it's going to be really hard to make progress, even with the non-nuclear weapon states fully engaged. Yeah. So I think there's a huge culture agenda here, and it's one that, you know, back to the question about what can people not at the State Department or Defense Department do? You can educate yourself. You can engage um, people in your um, immediate yeah. network. Um, you can vote. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, you know, when I was uh, in, in a young person in college, this is what we breathed. There were protests on the streets in any given city on any given day. It was a completely different uh, conversation. Yeah. And so that, getting that kind of public engagement again, I think could make a quite significant difference. Yeah, and with regard to the EA community specifically, I think there are a lot more resources now in terms of people who are part of this community who understand something about nuclear weapons who you can reach out to. I would love to see more writing on the forum, for example. I would love to see the more traditional nuclear community investing in, for example, summaries of important books or articles that lower the barriers to entry so that we can, um, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that needs to happen, is to lower the barriers of entry so that we can all engage in this conversation together. And I am so optimistic and enthusiastic based on what I've seen in terms of the, the, the talent in this community and the dedication. And for those of us who have been working on this issue for some time, it's so heartening to see other people. You know, you feel like you're running a marathon and all of a sudden you look over and you see someone else running it with you. And that just feels really good. That The challenge, you still got to finish the 26 miles. <laughs> we got a lot of them left, right? But um, uh, yeah, I, I think we can all go to dinner now. Um, but I uh, hope we have a chance to, to talk again soon. Thank you to our panelists. This was phenomenal. Thank you. Good. Thank you all.